We're in 1 Timothy. The passage this morning is chapter, taken from chapter 4, verses 6 through 16. So let's read those verses together. In pointing out these things to the brethren, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus, constantly nourished on the words of the faith and of the sound doctrine which you have been following. But have nothing to do with worldly uh, fables, fit only for old women. On the other hand, discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. For bodily discipline is only of little profit, but godliness is profitable for all things, since it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. It is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance, for it is by this we labor and strive, because we have fixed our hope on the living God, who is the savior of all men, especially of believers. Prescribe and teach these things. Let no one look down on your youthfulness, but rather in speech, conduct, love, faith, and purity, show yourself an example of those who believe. Until I come, give attention to the public reading of scripture for exhor to exhortation and teaching. Do not neglect the spiritual gift within you, which, you, which was bestowed on you through the prophet the prophetic utterance with the laying on of the hands by the presbytery. Take pains with these things. Be absorbed in them so that your progress will be evident to all. Pay close attention to yourself and to your teaching. Persevere in these things, for as you do this, you will ensure salvation both for yourself and for those who hear you. In verse 6, he says, point out these things. What things? Well, if you go back, beginning in chapter 2, and Paul spends chapter 2, chapter 3, and the first part of chapter 4, pointing out things, instructing Timothy, giving him instructions on what he is to be doing. Now, he was in Ephesus. Ephesus, at that time, was one of the stronger churches. It had an, a, a, apparently an effective eldership. But yet, Paul says, I want you to teach the brothers certain things. I want you to bring to their remembrance. I want you to educate them. I want you to bring the church up to speed on these issues. And the first issue he talked about was prayer. Now, you would think that in a church with strong elders and a, a vibrant, growing church, that they would need some reminders on prayer. That's how important prayer is. That's how, how much importance God puts on having you talk with him and having you listen to him. There is nothing more important for us than to have that communication with him. And so he spends time doing that. And then he talks about women. Now what's very interesting, because I look out over the, the crowd here, <laughs> the crowd, and I go, I almost feel like I'm Paul at a riverside. And there should be a lady named Lydia here. Because if you know the story, Paul goes into the, the town. There's no synagogue. He goes down by the river where there's usually a prayer meeting and he finds a host of women. If we're going to say who's the backbone of the church, it's women. And what's interesting, too, is that he talks about women and their roles and what they're to be doing or not doing. And, and we're not going to go into a lot of those details. We're not going to get bogged down in some of that stuff that we can get bogged down with. About what a woman can and can't do, should and shouldn't do. And he doesn't deal with it here, but he does it in other places when he talks about widows. He never talks about widowers. And there's a lot of reasons why he didn't talk about those. 
But the one thing he gives the church as responsibility is that the church is responsible for widows, and he goes and acts, and, and, and also orphans. The church is responsible for taking care of these people. Not Social Security, not Medicare, not welfare, not food, uh, whatever they call food, ES, uh, not food stamps anymore, but it's whatever the other, the new, the new term, so it's not, because food stamps got a negative connotation, so they had to change the name, so it wasn't so, it didn't sound so negative, it didn't, so you wouldn't be embarrassed, you wouldn't have to say you had food stamps. He says, that's the church's responsibility. If you have a widow in your midst, then church, you better be taking care of her. Because that's God telling you that's your job as a church is to take care of widows. And he's very careful about defining and saying who a widow is. But then he begins chapter 3 and he starts talking about elders or overseers or presbyters or some versions even pastors and for deacons, and he spends time. And why would he do that if the church already has them? Because it's a growing church. Paul had ordained the original elders. The church is now several years older. It's growing. They're going to need more elders. They're going to need more deacons. So Paul is telling Timothy, Here's the criteria that you put on these men who seek these offices and women for the deacons. And then he says, what else is important to a church? Prayer? Women? Overseers and deacons? And then he goes, apostasy. Teaching False doctrine. Teaching something that's not in this book. Teaching what I believe. Teaching what, how I understand it as if it were God speaking. I do admire preachers when they say, now this is me talking. This is my opinion. Okay, Which means you can take it or leave it. But when it's God's word, you don't have a chance. You don't have the choice of taking it or leaving it. And then he says that um, nourished on the words of the faith and the sound doctrine which you have been following. What would be some of the words that come to mind? to you when he talks about this. When he says, being constantly nourished on the words of faith and the sound doctrine which you've been following, what pops into your head? I said, well, I'll give myself the quiz. What pops into my head when I read that verse? The first one that popped in my head was, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Joshua, in Joel, mend your hearts and not your garments. Samuel, to obey is better than sacrifice. David, as the deer pants for the water, so my soul pants for you. David, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. From Leviticus, love your neighbor as yourself. Again, in Malachi, turn the hearts of the fathers to the sons, and the sons to the father. And in Matthew, come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden. I will give you rest. Take my burden on me, and I will give you rest. Those are words of faith and sound doctrine. He wants us to be versed in these scriptures 
so that when, as he tells us in Peter, that when you're being asked to help be held accountable, you're going to be able to defend yourself. But Paul says a little bit nicer things here. He says, dwell on these things. Be nourished by them. This is what feeds your spirit. This is what feeds feed your, feed your soul. Is by having these words in your heart, in your mind. Because it's sound doctrine. All these things he's been pointing out. All these things he's going to continue pointing out sound doctrine, scripture. Verse 7, uh, I started out a couple weeks ago with the, um, the homeless breakfast, and I said, how many of you have heard the saying, that's an old wives' tale? Now, most of us probably in here have heard that phrase, it's an old wives' tale. And I said, well, how many of you realize that's a out of the Bible. Because it's right here. He says, have nothing to do with worldly fables fit only for old women. Boy, what a sexist statement. Whew. Try making that on a campaign speech. <laughs> Is it a sexist statement? Well, not really, because we know that Paul wasn't a sexist. Uh, you, you want to find out, read Romans 16. You want to find out where Paul put women in the church. And how he reminds us how to take care of widows. But in that society in that day, when you got old, who had the luxury of being of having burdens removed from them, of, of doing the everyday things. Your grandmother in 60 AD, your husband's died, you're living with your oldest son, his wife, their children. Those children are now teenagers. What have you got to do? Really not much. Because those burdens have been taken away from you. He tells us in another passage what you're to be doing. You're to be training and teaching the younger women. You're going to be teaching them how to be mothers, how to be wives. That's your role. Don't fall into the trap of gathering together in your sewing circle and gossiping and telling tales. Because it's not good. In today's society, because men can also join that same elite group, we are going to do the same thing. Don't fall into the trap of sharing old men's tales. Old men's tales. But on the other hand, discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. For, God, for bodily discipline is only of little profit but godliness is profitable for all things since it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. If I spent eight hours a day lifting weights, eating high-protein food, work, doing this treadmaster, doing all these things, building up my body, there is profit in that. but a little. But if you spend your day praying, worshiping, singing songs in your heart, studying God's word, wow, look at the prophet. That's what he's telling us here. Yes, you do take care of your bodies. Yes, you do spend time exercising. You do spend time eating the right foods. You do spend time getting the right amount of sleep, as some people didn't do last night. Okay? But, that, and that is profitable for this life. But God wants us to prepare for the next life. 
And so he says, then hold on to the things, this doctrine, for the good things. So what promises then do we have in today's life of of becoming godly? So what advantages to us? What is an advantage to me today from becoming godly? Well, let's look at 2 Peter, the third chapter. We look at verses, uh, starting in verse 10. And we're going to find Peter gives us three reasons why we want to physically, in this world, become godly. Now, it begins a little differently than what we may think. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief in which the heavens will pass away with a roar and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat and the earth and its works will be burned up. Since all these things will be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? Looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God because of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning and the elements will be melt with intense heat. But according to his promise, We are looking for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since you look for these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace, spotless and blameless, and regard the patience of our Lord as salvation. Peter says that seeking godliness in this life will give us peace. We won't feel guilty. We won't be worried about tomorrow. We're just going to accept it. We're going to be innocent. Now, for some of us, that's a challenge, and we, really? What does innocent mean? Because what if I have an evil thought? Or a lurid thought? Or an angry thought? not what innocence means. Innocence means your approach on life. How do you go about viewing other people? Is it like the child? Or is it with preconceived ideas of what kind of person that is? When I see a man with a bald head and he doesn't have a lot of years on him, uh, what kind of guy is that? Okay. When I see Women dress different ways. When I see tattoos, when I see all that, what, what do I see? Where am I coming from? If I'm coming from innocence, I just see a person. Don't have any idea what that person's like. I'm not going to prejudge them. I'm not going to have a preconceived idea. I'm just going to say, hi, how are you? I'm out. How are you doing today? innocence he says I'm going to teach you to be patient godliness gives us patience I'm patient in a lot of things I'm not patient with stupid drivers and of course I'm one of them sometimes so I'm impatient with myself I'm impatient with people who don't want to listen to my sound wisdom that, that's my own input. <laughs> okay. I get patient with my wife when she wants to do something I don't want to do or she w- doesn't want to do something I want to do. I get impatient. But the one thing I'm patient, one thing God has taught me is to be patient and wait on him. Forty years ago, I asked God to give me a position as a pastor. Forty years. He's made me wait. Forty years. And that led to Beverly and I talking about how God uses numbers in the Bible, and we're going to look into that in a few weeks. My first wife dies. 
God says, be patient now. Go through your grief. And I'll, I'll bring you the next, I'll bring you your next bride. Well, actually, he brought it to me too fast as far as I was concerned. Because I wasn't ready. He said, be patient. Just play. Just do what I'm telling you to do. Follow what I'm teaching. Follow what I'm leading you. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 12, we're going to find another reason why we want to be godly. He says, For our proud confidence is this, the testimony of our conscience, that in holiness and godly sincerity, not in fleshly wisdom, but in the grace of God, we have conducted ourselves in the world, and especially toward you. How many times have we been told that pride, we're not supposed to have pride? Right? You don't. I'd be proud. Well, I'm not proud of myself. I've been myself. But I am proud of what God has made. And my confidence, my pride is in the fact that I have a clear conscience. Godliness gives us a clear conscience. And he says, how can I prove it? By my conduct. Your conduct will be proof and evidence of your clear conscience. Of your good conscience. And then Joshua 1.9, he gives us another reason for being godly. In Joshua 1.9, he says, Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not tremble or be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Why do I want to be godly? Because I want God covering my back. You know, that's a popular phrase now. I got your back. Well, I want God to have my back. And he says, when you strive to be godly, not only will I make you strong and courageous to step out, but you can do it because I'm right here with you. I've got your back. Well, I guess I can't argue with that. I guess I better start being godly if I'm not. And if I am godly, I better make sure I'm staying godly and I'm getting on to the getting on with uh, what God wants me to do. Verse 9, an interesting verse. It is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance. Paul is elevating his teachings and his writings to Scripture. He is saying, this is the Scripture. This is God's word. Paul may be writing these words down. Paul may be speaking these words from a, from a pulpit. But these are God's words. And he makes it a definitive statement. You know, this is it. This is scripture. Timothy, what I'm writing to you is the Bible. Verse 10. For it is for this we labor and strive because we have fixed our hope on the living God who is the Savior of all men, especially of believers. That phrase, Savior of all men, especially believers, is one of those passages that um, we feel we have to interpret. It's been translated. This is a translation. This is one of those passages of scriptures that requires us to interpret what God is saying. What is he saying here? Is he saying that all men are saved? And that there's a special group of saved people called believers? Is that what he's saying? That we're sometimes, that we're different from the unbelievers? When it comes to salvation? Well, remember to keep the passage in its context. 
we can take this passage out and say, look at this, because there are people, if you're on Facebook and you scroll, if you get enough face, news feed, you'll find there are people out there who believe that everybody's saved. Especially if you, if you even just say, I know Jesus. No matter what you do in your life, no matter what you support or do, you're saved. But that's the context, not the context of this passage. We have to remember when we get a scripture that we need to interpret, especially when the world has tried to redefine what it means, or even churches have tried to redefine what it means, we have to keep it in its context. He's talking about the fact of who Jesus was. And when he died, he died for everybody. Salvation is available for every human being. And for those who profess Jesus Christ, duh, you can say it without equivocation, they're saved. Prescribe and teach these things. Didn't know Timothy and Paul were doctors, huh? We only thought Luke was the great, right? Luke was the good physician. Jesus was a great physician, right? Well, Paul says, I've got a prescription here for you. And it's what I've been teaching. Prescribe and teach these things. What were these things? We started off in verse 6. What were those things? What he taught in chapters 2, chapter 3, begin chapter 4? Prescribe and teach these things. The next verse doesn't apply to me. Verse 13. Until I come, give attention to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation and teaching. Now, if you have a New American Standard Bible, which is what I read from, they have words in italics. And in this passage of Scripture, verse 14, the, um, in verse 13, the word public is in italics. The word of Scripture is in italics. In verse 15, it's absorbed as in italics. And what the translators here are trying to tell us is those words are not in the original language. But most languages that are spoken use different rules than we use in English. Because it depends on the context you use a word as to what it really means. And so if you read that scripture, that, that, in verse 13, It says, until I come, give attention to the reading, to exhortation and teaching. There's only one thing Paul was concerned about them reading. Now it's the scriptures. So everyone who read that from Paul knew what he was talking about. And so the translators, and every translation does this in their own way, they then define what he meant by reading. So you would know what Paul was talking about. And they put the word public in because the word used for the reading is in the context of being read in public. It was like an oration. It wasn't a one-on-one -on -one talk. So the translators here you put in the word public. So there's just some words of how we use the Bible and, and so when you're reading your, trans, your translation of the Bible and it varies from someone else's it's because the translators trying to get the meaning of what the writer was saying that's what they came up with but there's one thing you always need to know no matter what version of the Bible you read for me, it matters which one I read. 
It doesn't matter to me which one you read because they all teach us the one thing we need to be saved. They're all in agreement with that. There's no confusion at all about that. So read the Bible that means the most to you. That means that talks to your soul and your spirit. Verse 16. Pay close attention to yourself and to your teaching. Persevere in these things. For as you do this, you will ensure salvation both for yourself and for those who hear you. Be it, pay attention to what you're saying. I remember uh, one time, I, I can't remember which job I was at. But something happened and I uttered a word that I shouldn't be using as a Christian. And no sooner than it was out of my mouth, then someone said, does a Christian talk like that? We are being watched. And some people in the world are just waiting to pounce on us when we make a mistake, when we slip up. Because now we're not Mr. or Mrs. Perfect, and now we're on their level. Sometimes that's how we're seen. So Paul says, pay close attention to what you're saying, what you're doing, what you're teaching. You know what's right. Persevere in doing right. And you have complete confidence in your salvation. When you're doing God's will, you know where you're going. Now, to the King Eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, the honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's prepare for our closing song with a prayer. Father in heaven, I thank you for these words that Paul gives us, the instruction. Uh, the book of Timothy is such a good instruction manual for his father. I thank you for that. And I pray that you will just uh, uh, open the heart's the hearer and may we persevere Father and may we share with one another there are a lot of people missing today Father and uh, we need to just share our faith with them and to encourage them in whatever and for whatever reasons and for whys and illnesses and travel and but share with those. Let them know that we care about them and we miss them. Help us, Father, to persevere in our faith. Be grounded in sound doctrine. And each of us, Father, today as we stand and sing these song, this song and close that we will determine and promise to you that we will persevere this week and we will obey. And we will go forth. For this we pray through Jesus.